only a 300 base sequence, which is just a, you know, a little teeny snapshot. You know, usually you, you could never get a paper published with that small amount of sample. There have to be thousands of bases before they would be considered. And only one base was substituted. And that substitution had never been reported for human samples that had been submitted to Genbank, the archive. But it had been reported for chimpanzees at that locus, at that site on the mitochondrial genome. But one out of 300 could be a misread, it could be just a uh, you know, degradation of the tissue sample. Uh, you just, it just was not conclusive. But it was intriguing, nevertheless. Doug followed up for the next program by having some more of the tissue sent to a, an outfit, a laboratory in Minnesota, and um, all they got was bacteria. And the sample was degraded to the point that you know, it was nothing there, except for recent uh, bacterial growth on it. So uh, the next year we went back up, it was earlier in the season. It was a very cool, cool spring, the blueberry harvest. We were commenting because in northern Minnesota they usually had a big blueberry festival. And they had to ship blueberries up from south, from further south, to hold the festival because their crop hadn't ripened yet. And so we were up there, and it was just dead. I mean, up in Ontario, the bear, the shrubs hadn't even blo uh, finished blossoming yet, let alone bear fruit. And so that was a, probably a big uh, part of the food base there. And there just wasn't very much wildlife at all. But then we got this report of. Uh, sighting at Grassy Narrows, which was about 150 miles southwest, or south of us, yeah, southwest of the base camp. Um, and so we pulled up stakes and went down there. And it was a very interesting interview. The witnesses, two Native American or First Nations women, were on their way to a berry patch. The berries had just come on there, because a little further south. And uh, they rounded a bend and saw a black figure uh, and this was in the afternoon. It was on the shady side of the tree line on the road, but they saw it very clearly from the distance they were at, and uh, it took a few steps toward them and then just made a right in and turned into the trees and disappeared. And they were kind of shook up, and a, an older lady and her adult daughter, their testimony was very, very believable. The son, upon hearing this, went out with some friends to the proximate site and found some tracks and made a cast in them. Well, the casting that he made was a composite of a sow, bear, and her cub. Uh, and it was very straightforward. There were, we, when we went out, there were bear tracks everywhere. I mean, the bears, the, the berries were on the site that they were picking. It was this huge clear-cut area where they'd sold the timber and it had been clear-cut. And it had grown back in just lush with all kinds of berries. Salmon berries and huckleberries and, and uh, you name it. It was, it was quite prolific. Uh, it was amazing when we were out there. And so lots of there were bear tracks all over the place. And uh, so I don't doubt what they saw from her description, from her, her familiarity with the wildlife and all. But uh, I think he just saw a clear set of tracks. And you know how it is when you bears have a relatively flat hind feet, five toes. Oh, well, this thing, because it was composite, had six or seven toes, <laughs> which was one giveaway right off the bat. But. Um, but it was very straightforward, you know, we found more examples of very clear tracks and you could put that cast right down and say, all right, here's this, here, here's the baby track, and it could have even been the, the very tracks of those same, that same pair of individuals. So that was, uh, that was the extent of, of that. You know, I, people keep asking me, should I go and rent that cabin? I'll stay up there the whole, whole summer. And I tell them, you better like to fish because it's not a place that you, you know, uh, they might come to you. I think we were just done lucky that first year. Uh, if, if in fact what transpired really was a, an experience encounter with with one, um, but uh, no, it's uh, that. I, I think one of the things about that certain situation was, and this surprised me. Right there in the kitchen was this laminated placket with instructions for the occupants. When you're ready to leave. Uh, you can leave behind any canned good or, or unopened packaged dry goods, but any perishables, any fruit, vegetables, bread, whatever, go and throw it behind the outhouse. What? <laughs> throw it behind the outhouse? Well, so that was what they would do. And so most of the tenants there are there for three or four days, 
an animal with a few smarts, hearing a float plane fly over and land, uh, three or four days, there's going to be a smorgasbord out behind the outhouse. <laughs> well, we were there for five days. It's like, come on, come on, come on, you know, where's, where's dinner? I mean, maybe, maybe that's why the rocks were going. They wanted us to leave so we would throw all our stuff in the uh, back. Uh, so that might have been part of it, is, uh, you know, the smell of fish in trails for the fishermen and the food being thrown out there, the human activities and sights and smells, you know, the smell of fried fish carries a long ways out there. Um, who knows? I wouldn't go back, but I, see, I, mean, I think there are other places where you have I mean, it's, it's like me and fishing. If I catch a fish in the first five minutes, I'm great for the rest of the day. I can spend all day sitting there enjoying fishing and, and not catching anything. <laughs> but if I don't catch something, I lose interest and have to go off and do something. It's like the same with Sasquatch hunting. I, I'm not one who can go and sit in a blind for eight hours at a shot or whatever. I have to be tromping around the, the roads and the creek beds and so forth looking for sign. Uh, or at night, stalking along, walking quietly with my vision and, and stopping for a while and moving on to another place. That's just my, my strategy. So uh, spending the, the time and the effort to go to Snow Grove Lake, I don't think is necessarily productive. And, and you know, we sat and looked through, that was the other thing. We talked to the owner. There had been a few stories. And we flipped through the journal at the cabin, and there was that one entry where uh, the tenants had found an unusual set of footprints on the, one of the portage trails in the dust. And they thought it was, it was a 16 inch track they described it as a human looking track, 16 inches long. And then they kind of almost jokingly said, maybe it's Bigfoot. Uh, ha ha, you know, followed with that literally, ha ha, but not. So whether to take it seriously or not, or whether that was just one kind of a nervous ha ha. To suggest that it was a big thing. Do you advocate shooting one? I don't. Um, I know the late Grover Kratz, um, towards the end of his life, he, as he knew he was getting towards the end, he wanted to prove so bad he had been ridiculed among his colleagues. Maybe not ridiculed, but oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. yeah. And I know that he wanted to prove so bad. I, I read that in the later years he would drive around at night with a 30 yep. 30, yep. you know, hoping to come across one to shoot one to have the definitive proof. Sure. Well, and that was it. Do you advocate that? Well, no, I don't. I don't. Wouldn't it, that be the, the, I mean, the, well, sure. That yeah. would be the ironclad evidence. It would. It would. If, if, if you can justify it. And I, you know, Grover, it, he, he shouldered the ridicule. The motivation was he was convinced that the only way to prove it conclusively was a type specimen, was a corpse. And that's why he advocated that. And uh, when I first became involved with this, I, after a lot of mental wrestling, kind of working through the same mental process that he probably did, I adopted that position, uncomfortably, but I adopted that position. And our, our initial field operations, I was working with a gentleman who, uh, who, was, who, who uh, was a part owner of a big game uh, ranch in South Africa. He was very familiar with large caliber rifles and had access to some big firepower more than you would need to bring down in Africa or there here in North America. And so we were always prepared for that. And, and this is kind of a funny <laughs> turn of events, but the turning point for me, you know, like I said, there was always this mental wrestle and un uncomfortableness with that approach. I'd taken my younger kids to see Walt Disney's uh, Tarzan movies. Have you ever seen that show? No, have seen it? Well, there's, there's, there's a couple of contrasting characters. There's the, the dawdling professor who's willing to give up everything to live with the gorillas and study them, <laughs> learn about them. And then there's the guy, named Clayton, who is always armed to the hilt, and he shoots at everything that moves. And it suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, Jeff, which of these characters would be most alive? And I thought, well, why, why am I trying to do this? You know, to prove it to someone else. You know, or what, what is my primary uh, motivation? You know, I, I hope that we have advanced as a society beyond that. You know, sometimes it's really depressing when I go to a museum and do research. You pull up in the museum drawers, and these biologists at that time had collected dozens and dozens and dozens of specimens. I mean, they just decimated some of these populations in the name of science. And hopefully we've progressed beyond that. Now, I mean, look, they're, they're a remarkable resource. And a lot of the work we do, we couldn't have done without that. But it, when you reflect on that methodology, it's really sad. And in the literature, uh, especially for, for primate, uh, the conservation of rare and endangered species, there's 
there's more and more discussion about establishing a new precedent of recognizing a species on the basis of DNA alone. There is no existing example. We've differentiated subspecies or sibling species in museum collections by looking at the DNA and finding subtle differences that, that justify the splitting them. But there were always physical remains of those in the museums already. But now it's being argued that we shouldn't further imperil these populations, especially these populations like grapes that have slow turnover by collecting an individual that isn't going to readily be replaced, you know, in the next year, and, and use that voucher specimen in DNA. So, so do you have colleagues who disagree with you though that say, well, it's just one. And we can get at least do it once, and it's justifiable then to prove. Well, everybody. no, most of my colleagues who are sympathetic uh, uh, to the subject matter encourage me, uh, agree that, that there are other means. And at that point, we changed our whole approach. Uh, I'm, I know, like my collaboration with this fellow, he, he moved, so I was no longer working with him, and didn't have access to the resources anyway. Not that that was the reason, but I met another gentleman. John Lanzinski, who, who was of much similar mind as I, as my new position, my, my new adopted position. And so our thrust was to collect DNA. And we used uh, a you know, variety of different techniques for our hair snagging and tissue collection. We had, uh, um, well, it, it, we were not even using the device anymore. I mean, everything kind of went on hold when Melvin Ketchum's project started. And unfortunately, you know, that went into the circuit. Now we're hoping that uh, Brian Sykes' project is, is uh, will, will produce some credible results and maybe give us some positive results. Okay. Um, just to, how familiar are you with the infrasound? I was looking at your yeah. little pamphlet and you kind of addressed that a little bit. Yeah. One of the experiences that um, I've had with parabolic is, I don't know how to describe it other than like Geiger, it sounds like a Geiger counter and I don't know mm. what the heck that is. It'd be something worth um, checking into, but when there was something like a rock throwing incident or within a, a five to ten minute time frame, one, in one time uh, something crossing the river you could tell was bipedal and it was big, scared the bejeebers out of us because you could hear it crossing this three to four foot deep river. Um, just, you know, when you put the parabolic on it, it was just this really loud ticking and it interfered with their radio. Oh. That type of thing. So I don't know, but then it would stop. It wasn't like a continual thing. Right. And it would be in that direction. I just wonder if you ever heard anything about that. Well, uh, the, the thing that kind of got me thinking about infrasound was the was a comment that was made by uh, Dr. Benson at the, down in the Corpus Christi in the laboratory, where he suggested there could very well, and upon listening to some of these sounds and the form and structure, he suggested that there could be infrasonic elements. Of course, the devices used to record the sounds that he was listening to were not sensitive to that range, that frequency, so no one know for sure from that. I began to look into it. I, I was intrigued by it because I was always mystified by the fact that that I, you know, I talk, would talk to these intrepid outdoorsmen, these staunch hunters, uh, very macho men, who uh, were reduced to quaking, <laughs> you know, uh, milk toast when after an experience. They wouldn't go back to that spot ever again. They won't go in the field without being armed. And I think what would, what would upset someone so much unless it was something on, on different level, multiple levels. And so when I learned that infrasound can have be evoked such deep-seated emotional responses, then it became more interesting. So I started researching other primates and there was a paper that had been published looking at the form and frequency of, of uh, territorial calls in primates across Africa. And there was an inverse relationship of the frequency level of their vocalization with their home range size and, and body size with type correlated with home range size. So the bigger the animal and the larger the range, the lower the frequency. So it had more carry and more penetrance in the forest. I contacted that researcher and I said, have you done any work, unpublished work, on great apes? And he said, no, I haven't yet. He said, I said, well, do you have any sense, any prediction? He said, well, given their large body size, if you just extrapolated, they would be in the infrasonic range. And then, doing the comparative anatomy, uh, great apes have extra laryngeal air pouches. The, there are diver 
articulate little blind alleys that come off of the larynx, both above and below the vocal cords. And some of them, like in, in orangutans, are extensive. You know, when you see these big male orangs and how they have this big, what looks like a big double chin, all the dewlap, that's actually an air sac. And they're also, you know, and they're complex. There's air sac, there are air sacs that go up sometimes underneath the pec muscle and then into the, into the armpit. They can actually cross their arms like this. It's like squeezing a backpack. And create a sustained. If, if the if the diverticular below the vocal cords, you can create a sustained airflow, much more than your lung capacity, across the vocal cords for these deep, loud calls. Plus, they provide a resonating chamber. So, orangs have extensive ones. Um, chimpanzees or gorillas have large ones, variable. Chimpanzees have them much less frequently, and humans only on very rare occasions. Bears also have small extra. Which is interesting too. And we've been, we actually tried some preliminary work. It's really hard to evoke a vocalization, like a territorial vocalization or antagonistic, in a captive animal on demand. Mm -hmm. So, unless you have the luxury of, of recording 24 7 and then the capacity to review those, and in the old days, back then, you had to sit and listen or watch the sonogram at normal speed of the whole recording. So it would take days and days and days to record, you know, a couple of weeks worth of 